What's going on, everybody? Like the show, share the show, tell a friend, tell a friend. We live, man. We're about to get it in. Um, before I do get started, though, uh, I hope y'all having a good Friday. I really don't expect a lot of people to pop up, but um, I just wanted to kind of get this build off because I was going through some stuff yesterday and reviewing some stuff, and then I was like, you know what, it's time to just really put people up on game. So uh, today we're going to like slow the conversation down about these ships, and there's something intricate that I want to 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 share. Um, I do have a primary source available. Um, we know that they don't understand or accept certain type of information, and that's cool. But we're going to get to it. So uh, appreciate everybody that has tapped in. Those of you who have not spoken in the chat, those of you who have gave me a listening ear, I do see Brother Lavelle in the chat. I know there's other people that are listening. Uh, peace to all of you and those of you who will come in, those of you who will catch the replay. Um, on the other side of this, uh, these other two commercials, we will get directly into the build. Now. I love myself. Three different brands. I hope Go you love yourself gotcha. because love is only love when you love somebody else. Yeah. What hair looks like after slavery? Transatlantic slave trade. The transatlantic slave trade by the European changes everything for Central and West Africans. Let's briefly talk about the transatlantic slave trade. The Portuguese and later the English, the French, and the Dutch got involved and enslaving Africans in large parts of West Africa, the Gulf Coast of Guiana, and the Congo River Basin, were significant areas of human exports to the Americas, mostly to sugar plantations in the Caribbean. By the late 17th century, the so-called triangle trade developed. European ships loaded with guns, textiles, tobacco, and manufacturing goods sailed to Africa slave ports and traded those goods for captives. European slave traders then took those Africans to the New World where they were sold. With that money, the European purchased staples such as sugar, tobacco, rum, and coffee, then sold for enormous profits back in Europe. The profits was often reinvested in other goods to be traded for captives back in Africa and so on. If you want a more, if you want more in-depth information on the transatlantic slave trade, I recommend you read Hugh Thomas' book titled "The Slave Trade: The Story of the Atlantic Slave Trade, 1440 through 1870." This is a thick book, roughly 912 pages, and worth sacrificing some of your time to read. The book is almost the same price as a supersized combo from a fast food restaurant, destroying the image of African heritage. Europeans who had traded and communicated with Africans knew the complexity and the significance of black hair. They were often struck by the various hairstyles that they saw within each community. In an effort to dehumanize and break the African spirit, 
Europeans shaved the heads of enslaved Africans in front of rivals to the Americas. This was not merely a random act, but a symbolic removal of African culture. The shaving of the hair represents the removal of any trace of African identity and further acts to dehumanize. Time to go to war, man. Please again, like this show, share this show, tell a friend, tell a friend. We are live. Um so what's the inspiration for today? I mean, I'm still hearing remnants of people saying, Where are the slave ships? They're still, they still don't believe that people were brought here to the Americas that they believe that it happened the other way. Well, I heard a kid say this. So I'm going to do the best that I can do to not destroy this bill today for this particular kid that I heard say this. And it was disheartening. So I asked the kid, so where do you think you come from? How do you think you appear here? We always been here. That's what they said. I said, who was they? And the kid didn't really say a name. It was like, you know, that's it's all over the internet. So it's, it's everywhere. What do you mean, who is they? You know, I said, the source of your information. And the kid responded, well, you know, like I said, IG, TikTok, you know what I'm saying? Snapchat. And I was like, oh, okay. So you think that those are viable sources for your information to be able to educate yourself and then spew that out to the world? And, you know, there was a little hesitation there, but still it was there. And um, so this is for the kid um, who doesn't understand their existence, their history, and where they come from and how they got here. So, uh, what up, Kofi? What up, Infinite Minds? What's good? Barry Loaded, too smooth in the building. I don't know who else is out there. Y'all haven't spoken yet, but salute, peace, kisses, hugs, whatever the hell y'all need today. You know what I'm saying? Pour out a little liquor or water. Um, you know what I'm saying? Whatever it may be, man, this one for you. So uh, before we get into the build, I want to talk about technology. I want to walk you through the scientific process in order to help you understand what it takes to answer the question of where are the slave ships. And I want, I want you to keep this in mind. And there's something that I'm going to add to that that you could use for yourself in the future. Now, I know a lot of people like to confiscate the sources. So <laughs> in the description of this particular video, anything that I say can be corroborated with what is identified in the description of this particular video and or my library to... my left according to this but it's really on my right all right so um again aboriginals always ask where are the slave ships okay so let me go ahead and uh start sharing my screen hold on let me cancel that share come back to full screen because i don't want to be on the screen and i want to walk you through a few things now some of this shit I mean, stuff, my bad. Some of this stuff is going to be very new to you. Okay? And that's why I always leave the, the, the links because I need you to reread this. So, anyway, uh, we're coming from the hip of 
National Ocean Service. All right, so National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration uh, produced this uh, this article that we're going to discover or we're going to review right now. Excuse me. So this article was last updated on uh, on January twentieth, twenty twenty three. It's over here on the right hand side, and the author is from this institution. All right, so we need to know a few things about bodies of water uh or whatever we just need to know to gain an understanding so hopefully you can see this pretty clear i'm gonna try to zoom in as best as i can if you're on your cell phone go in your settings and change your quality uh go down to advance and change your quality to the highest level and that'll clear up your cell phone screen and you'll be able to see this a little bit more clearly so what is hydrography? Hydrography is the science that measures and describes the physical features of bodies of water. So if you're on a lake, or if you're near a creek, if you're near a pond, if you're near a river, right? Um, hydrography explains this to you it measures and describes the physical features of the bodies of water that you're looking at all right so you have hydrographic surveys are conducted using multi-beam echo sounders all right so i know you're like what the hell is a, a multi-beam echo sounder so i didn't want to add this into the in, into the bill but I wanted to do it live so people could uh, properly see this stuff, right? So what is a multi-beam echo sounder? And I'm gonna share my screen. We're gonna go back to, uh, I don't wanna use it. I wanna go to Wiki. You just need a basic understanding of what this is. So a multi-beam echo sounder is a type of sonar that is used to map the seabed. You can't see it. All right, now you can see it. All right, what's a sonar? A sonar is a technique that uses sound propagation to navigate, measure distances, ranges, communicate with, or detect objects on or under the surface of water, such as other vessels. All right. Now, a multi-beam echo sounder is a type of sonar that is used to map the seabed. It emits acoustic waves in a fan shape beneath the transceiver. Uh, uh, the time it takes for the sound waves to reflect off the seabed and return to the receiver is used to calculate the water depth. Unlike other sonars and echo sounders, MBES uses beam foaming or forming to extract directional information from the returning sound waves, uh, producing a swath of depth soundings from a single ping. So as you can see here, right? You have a boat, it's up here. They have the technology below. It shoots sounds down until these, uh, these sounds hit something and then return the sound back to the ship. While that sound travels, uh, there's other technology that adds to understanding the depth. And then it gives you the information that you need. Now, that's technical. And a layman is never really going to go that far in trying to understand stuff. They want answers. But this technology is significant in finding stuff on the oceanic floor. Right? I want you to keep that in mind. So, again, 
Hydrography is the science that measures and describes physical features of the bodies of water and the land areas adjacent to the bodies of water. Now, a multi-beam echo sounding beams sweep the seafloor as the ship passes over the survey area. All right, so what products are made from hydrographic survey data? This is where you get your nocturnal charts and your hydrography models. If you are familiar, right, that's a better view. Um, this is how you see that, like this little, if you've ever been on a boat or if you've ever been on a lake and they got these little, these little texts, these little dials, or uh, looks like odometers, um that's showing you how to travel the lake and where it is uh, specifically where you are in the water as a navigational system that's what a nocturnal chart is and due to the hydrographic survey that information can be instilled it's similar to like MapQuest if you're driving in a car or better yet uh nowadays people use um what y'all you was or people use Google, right, for directions. And that information had to come from somewhere in order for you to be able to access it in the sense. Okay? So um, I need everyone to fully understand the technology. Uh, well, to understand that you, certain parts of this technology, which goes over people's heads, helps answers a lot of questions. So we know that they use hydrography as a way to find certain things, but they also use that multi-beam echo sounder, right, um, to locate stuff and give us the perspective of the seafloor and how deep and stuff it is. All right. So we cool. We got the models out the way. Uh, I'm not going to bore you to death with a whole lot of other stuff. So we know that they use surveying with multi-beam echo sounders as the primary method of obtaining hydrographic data. So anything in the water that they need data for is going to come from the multi-beam echo sounders. All right, cool. Now, just a little piece of information here. Did you know in 1807, President Thompson, uh, Thomas Jefferson signed a mandate order and a survey of the nation's coast all right so who conducts hydrographic surveys the noaa's office of coast survey conducts hydrographic surveys and creates nocturnal charts of u.s waters so uh there's forty-three thousand square nocturnal miles of u.s waters considered critical to navigation between two and 3,000 square nocturnal miles of U.S. water surveyed by NOAA and commercial contractors annually. Uh, less than 1,000 nocturnal charts over 95,000 miles of shoreline and 3.6 million square nocturnal miles of U.S. water. All right, let me bag out again. And let me go in just a little bit to give context. So hydrography is the science that measures and describes the physical features of the navigatable portion of the Earth's surface and adjoining coastal areas. Hydrographic survey, uh, surveyors study these bodies of waters to see what the floor looks like. As you can see from the uh, this gentleman over here looking at his screen, right, he's looking at the floor. So if a boat was sunk, or a ship was sunk and it hit the floor, right? The technology that is used to, to provide that information back would be retrievable via this right here. Now, NOAA's Office of Coast Survey conducts hydrographic surveys to measure the depth in the bottom of configuration of water bodies. That data is used to update nocturnal charts and develop hydrographic models. This information is vital to navigating the ocean and our nation's waterways. Hydrographical surveys are also used in NOAA's Integrated Ocean and Coast Mapping Program, providing information for a number of purposes, including seafloor structural construction, 
laying pipelines and cables, dredging, anchoring, and understanding fish habits. What up, Kimo? Peace, Juju. Peace, Olu. Peace, Marquise. What's good? Never again. Never hungry again. Well, that's a funny ass name. All right. So now we can understand that they have the technology to be able to see the seafloor and create 3D, a 3D imaging that's going to allow them to see what is actually in the floor. Also study the habits of fish, anchor down certain things, dredging, pipelines and cables. So people just wondering how they got them oil tankers out there in the middle of the Gulf Coast trying to drill for oil and all of that stuff. Well, they would have had to have used a hydrographer, a, hyd a hydrography in order for them to do what they needed to do. All right. So to help the young man in the chat that just commented, brother, you're late. Because about six years ago, I named every ship and walked through coastlines and everything else. I just wanted to throw that out there for you. So I don't know what you showed them. I'm glad you showed them something. Hopefully it sticks, but you're late, so you don't know. So again, what is hydrography? It is the science that measures and describes the physical features of bodies of water and the land areas adjacent to those bodies of water. Surveying with multi-beam echo sounds is the primary method of obtaining hydrographic data. By mapping our water depth, the shape of the seafloor coastline, the location of the, uh, the possible obstructions and the physical features of water bodies, Hydrography helps to keep our maritime transportation system moving safely and efficiently. Multi-beam echo sounding beams sweep the seafloor as the ship passes over the survey area. Multi-beam echo sounder beams bounce off the seafloor and return the ship where the depth is recorded. Hydrographers measure water depth and search for shoals, rocks, and wrecks. Yes. Hydrographers do what? Measure water depth and search for shoals, rocks, and wrecks that could be hazardous to navigation. They also collect information and then it provides on water level tides, currents, temperatures, uh, salinity. Now, I don't wanna get into all the other stuff. I'm just trying to give you a basic understanding on why hydrography is important and the multi-beam echo sounder beams is important in answering the question, where are the ships? Next, what is a sonar, right? A sonar is uses sound waves to see the seafloor. So here's a little video about what a sonar is, but I need to stop and reshare so that I can make sure the audio is clear to everyone involved in the chat. And I'm gonna expand this out. You probably, probably know this sound from the movies. It's a submarine sonar ping. Sonar is used to see what lies beneath the waves. Today's high-tech sonar systems used by NOAA send out rapid sound pulses that bounce off the seafloor and back to scan what's below. These soundings produce amazingly detailed pictures of the unseen seafloor. Multi-beam echo sounders, shown here, measure the depth of the seafloor. Hydrographers use the multi-beam soundings to create nautical charts and produce colorful maps of the underwater terrain. In general, red is used to show shallow depths and blue or purple for deeper depths. Side scan sonar, the device trailing the ship shown here, captures black and white imagery that helps to identify submerged wrecks and obstructions. Here's a visualization created by a NOAA hydrographer that's beautiful to watch and will give you a good idea of how hydrographers use sophisticated computer programs to transform sonar imagery into nautical charts and other products that help keep mariners safe at sea. 
So that illustration was on point. Um, we got a lot out of that little, uh, that, well, not little. We got a lot out of that illustration that provided a closer look at what they were doing and how everything works. I shouldn't have to explain anymore, but uh, I just it gives us more information. So I want to make sure that we're clear. So uh, sonar short for sound navigation and ranging. That's what it's you know it's short for. It's helpful for exploring the mapping the ocean because sound waves travel farther in water than do radar and light waves. All right, so you have active sonar, which is transducers, uh, which emit an acoustic signal or pulse of sound into water. And then you have passive sonar systems are used primarily to detect the noise from marine objects, such as submarines or ships and marine animals like whales. All right, so that's just keeping it on a basic level. Now, I want to go into, I want to let the beat build. So I want to continue to do things. I'm pull this up. I want to talk about X ray fluorescent testing services, which are always available. So, what the hell is that? Right? What is X ray fluorescent testing and what relevance does it have? in this conversation. Well, um, XRF analysis is a simple, highly accurate test method used to determine a material's chemical composition. All right, elements chemical analysis experts are ready to provide you with precise data regarding the properties of your materials. So the XRF testing uses a device to inundate the sample with a high energy primary X ray beam. The irradiated sample emits secondary X ray photons, characteristic to energy or wavelength of elements present in the sample. This instrument detects, then count the uh, imminent photons dispersed by selected crystals and identify and qu uh, quantify the elements present. The XRF is a popular analytical tool because of its non destructive nature. The ability to test materials with little to no preparation required, as well as being suitable for solid, liquid, or powdered samples. All right, so they give us an example that this is a tool used to uh, extract. Uh, okay, uh, some data that's actually needed. Keep that in mind. So let's go over here now. And let's get into one more. Remember, all of this, all of this is relevant to answering the question, where are these ships? All of this. All right, so uh, explore mini marine magnometer, okay? I know y'all don't know what a magnometer is. All right, a lot of people don't know what a magnometer is, but as you can see on the screen, this is a magnometer what what is it what does it do so this is a 3.8 uh kgs soaking where explore is the world's smallest and lightest high sensitivity magnometer it's ideal for inshore shallow water work or offshore towed behind side scans 
on AUVs or ROVs. Now, this is a one-man operation at 3.6 to 6.9 uh, kgs or 8 pounds, 15 pounds, right? Uh, high sensitivity without export uh, restrictions, of course, with 0 0.02 NT sensor sensitivity all the way to 0 0.001 NT counter sensitivity. Explore maintains high sensitivity without required an expert an export permit. Now, unmatched absolute uh, accuracy, uh, Explorers gives you consistent, repeatable data you can trust. At 0.1 NT, it is orders of magnitude more accurate than all competing magnometers. 2W ultra low power consumption basically says that can be powered by a single car battery for up to 200 hours. All right. Uh, the survey, it can survey in any direction, everywhere in the world. There's no heading error, no sen uh, no sensor warm-up time, maintenance-free overhauls of sensor. And, yeah, they use this in water to detect and do what needs to be done. As you can see, Explore is ideal for inshore geophysical survey, <coughs> archaeology. Wreck detection, magnetic mapping of harbors, various target detection in lakes, rivers, and ossuaries. This is significant information because remember, the research question is where are the ships? So, this tool, along with everything else that we just talked about, is e equivalent and equipped to answer the research question. All right, so now that you have a general understanding of what those things are, I want to take you to an article that was published in 2019 in regards to, you know, from the University of Southern Mississippi. Um, in this article is going to talk about something very important to all of y'all. And I think some people are already in the chat talking about it. But the new evidence shows USM scientists originally discovered America's last slave ship. So y'all need to know who these people were that found the last slave ship. Remember, where are the slave ships? All right, we got a sister right here who's into the business. All right, we, we got some words cleared up, so we should be able to breeze right through this without a problem. So it says, and I'm gonna zoom in, USM researchers use hydrographic mapping and sonar technology to help locate the sunken slave ship, Clotilda. Picture here is researcher Candace Gunnings. That's her name. This is Candace Gunnings. All right. A recent discovery in Alabama shows evidence that a team of researchers from the University of Southern Miss School of Ocean Science and Engineering discovered the Clotilde America's last slave ship more than a year ago. Ben Rains, a writer and documentarian who was uh, then a reporter of the AL.com, believed he had located the whereabouts of Clotilde deep in the water south of Mobile and wanted to know for sure. He contacted the SOSE director, Dr. Monty Graham, and set up a day for the hydrography team. Remember what I said, you got, you got hydrographic and you got the hydrography. So the hydrography team came out to assist on the quest. At the time we got to call it this project, there was a narrow window where the water was just right to do this. If you are familiar with uh, Samuel L. Jackson, when he goes back to Af when he goes to Africa, right to find out who he is, and he does all of these things. And one part of those videos, he talked about um, ship wreckage found off the coastline of Africa. And in another time, there was something I think more so in uh, on the European side of things, they were trying to do some research. But they had to time up, right? The current, the ocean water, all of that. So they had to do this deep dive 
when the water was perfect enough for them to do it, because if they did it any other time, it was too violent and they may not have survived that incidence to be able to extract the data that they needed to get, which was on the floorboard off of, uh, I believe it was in the Mediterranean or something like that, that was pivotal in uh, in proving that there was shipwreckage there, that the site had shipwreckage there, and that there were pieces of this slave ship on the bed of that uh, of the sea. All right, so back to the article. At the time we got the call for this project, there was a narrow window where the water was just right to do this. I saw this as an opportunity to not only discover a sunken piece of history, but to also use the expedition as a teaching moment for our students to use their trade to marry science and history under most unique circumstances. This was beautiful because it worked out well. They used their science, right? Which is what they were going to school to learn. That's what I mean by there, right? They were going to school to learn this stuff. So now they get to marry it with history. And that's what we're doing, ladies and gentlemen, when we talk about um, all of this information for, well, us, for us, right? We're using the tools of science to help marry, you know, to marry history and then provide the true story, our true story on how we got here, our, our, uh, the impact of how we got here, what we went through and where we came from ultimately. So. In April 2018, USM scientists conducted a hydrographic survey, right? How did they do that? Remember, they use a boat to send sound waves. The sound waves, uh, those signals are capturing the depth of the floor. There's stuff returning back to it. And then there's a tool on the back of the boat that is helping them map things out so they know what they're dealing with. All right? So... Uh, they did a hydrographic survey of the Mobile River on the east side of 12 Mile Island using the RF Lehman, which was outfitted with sonar capable of both uh, bathymetric mapping and side scan sonar imagery. A marine magnetics explorer pro mag magnometer for metal detection. Now, remember, I just showed y'all what a magnometer was. So now you know that they were using that little long orange thing as uh, a mechanism. To detect metal. Now, the Aplonics POS MV and the GPS antennas for positioning and the Validine Puck Lender for shoreline delineation and terrain. So, this is key. All right, now the team led the Maximum Van Norden coordinator of the U.S. Hydrographic Science Program. It included several doctors who shall not be named, but you see them in the article. Most importantly, Candace Gunning says she vividly remembers the mood on the vessel that day. And here's her quote. The day had an air of curiosity and enthusiasm as we embarked on a journey up the river. We had a lot more systems running than usual. It forced us to be even more engaged and attentive to what was happening on the monitors. With real-time hydrographic survey data coming in showing features that met the description of Clotilda, the mood overall was pensive. She continues to say, well, Gunning, originally from Santa Cruz, Trinidad, and Tobago, came to, uh, to the University of Southern Miss in 2011 to pursue a master's degree in hy uh, hydrography before beginning her PhD in marine science with an emphasis in hydrography in 2013. Now, during the Clotilda Discovery Survey, Gunning was responsible for survey line planning, operation of a system which offers bathymetry tracking backscatters and side scan imagery on survey object detection and pr uh, processing of the data for the production of the bathymetric chart of the area of survey. Dr. Graham said the team had almost finished their search to no avail. After all, they found were an array of sunken metal boats and lumber when suddenly gunning the sister Notice something strange showing up under the surface. It can't be underestimated how important Candace and Max were in us continuing our search that day, he said. 
They really helped us pinpoint the exact spot. Dr. Graham said Gunning and Van Norton had found an area of wreckage that perfectly mimicked the dimensions of Clotilda. Divers and technology aboard the vessel started to quickly find strong evidence linking their research to sunken slave ship. The week after the survey trip, the team processed and reviewed the collected data. USM researchers discovered about 10 possible contacts along the eastern side of the river. After further analysis, they narrowed down the three most important contacts could possibly be Clotilda. It made the simplest sense. This is where the ship was sunk. With every nail and wooden stake we pulled up, we thought this was it. We thought, my bad. Although the team found evidence of 19th century construction such as nails and believed the size was identical to the dimensions of Clotilda, researchers were told their findings weren't consistent enough to confirm the discovery. Thinking back to the moment I was told that the findings were inconsistent, I don't think I responded to the information, but instead absorbed it, Gunning said. I thought our work was significant despite the news. We conducted a survey in a body of water that, from all reports, had not been surveyed as extensively as we did. So my general outlook on that news was more acceptance than defeat. She said that this place wasn't surveyed as extensively as this team did. So when you ask the question, where are the ships, right? We know that they exist somewhere in the oceanic floor for those that were sunken. Others are made as memorabilia, especially if you go to Baltimore, off the east coast of Baltimore, there's a there's a ship that you can go in there like a museum and visit. And it was a slave ship. There's others that were sunken way out. We got other crash sites and we know this. But the technology and tools that were used help answer the research question. So let's continue. Any sting of defeat would no longer linger on. More scientists led by uh, Dr. Delgado and an authority maritime archaeologist descended upon the original spot uncovered by USM. After an intensive research such as X-ray fluorescent tests, we talked about that, comparisons of building materials, dimensions, and stories, and multiple dive teams, Delgado sent his findings to six experts for peer review on the data. Every one of them concluded this ship was in fact Clotilda. Gunning said here in the evidence they found is indeed uh, the Clotilda gives him uh, her a sense of relief that their work to unveil some of America's history wasn't in vain. I am truly pleased that our work has contri uh, contributed to a finding of that magnitude, she said. I've been reading even more about the ship and people associated with it, and I am relieved that we could add details to history. The Journeys Foundation may have been within the scope of hydrography and marine science, but Gunning said this discovery means more than that. The history surrounding U.S. Africa slave trade, the ship and the people on board holds great cultural, political, and historical significance. Specifically for those who are the descendants of its journey, this discovery may help bring closure and healing. I can imagine that from the generation to generation, this story was passed on, a story of culture's past that desperately needed a final chapter. I'm glad that we could help provide some of that, uh, some help with the contents of this few paragraphs of the final chapter. Hmm. Yeah, Sean, but that don't mean that, okay, they found a ship, right? How they know that that was a slave ship? I can hear the elbows churning with questions. How do we know that that was a slave ship, right? How do we know that this is, they're just words on paper. You just got people saying that this is just perspective. They're looking and grabbing and they're, they're wanting things. So ladies and gentlemen, I bring to you primary evidence. I'm not gonna read all of this because this is translated right here for you to be able to read it for yourself. But I wanna take you to the primary, right? We don't do we don't do all the other stuff. We we do primary over here. Okay? So, this is 13 pages, ladies and gentlemen. 
Let me zoom out. It's 13 pages, ladies and gentlemen. Let me zoom in so you can see. Miss Donaldson, dear sir. Right? You see it. It says the last slaver from US to Africa, AD 1860. Schooner Cotilda, built in Mobile, Mobile, Alabama by Captain Footer. This is written in the time of 1860 and preserved, scanned, and copies are made of it. Now, all of this information was extracted from here and made readable to you here. Here's what it says. Mr. Donaldson, dear sir, I have written some of uh, some of Schooner Clotilda, or Schooner is for Schooner, voyage and left it at Grist Mill with Mr. Jackson. Very respectfully yours, Captain W.M. Foster. Hmm. We're going to get into a little bit more about, well, I ain't really got to get into it, but there's a story behind all of this, and I'm going to let y'all be able to put it together. All right. So. The sentence below is slight or dark in ink, perhaps because of added later. I think the above was written by Mr. or Mrs. Home Foster. Original seems to be spelled Foster. Last slaver from U.S. to Africa, A.D. 1860, schooner Clotilda, built in Mobile, Alabama, by W.M. Foster, A.D. 1856. Fitted out on the coast of Africa to purchase a cargo of slaves, cleared and sailed from Mobile, March 4th. With the following cargoes 26 sacks of rice, 80 cast of a uh, gargant, right? You got uh, basically it's containing alcohol in it, rum, 30 bottles, beef, uh, 40, uh, pork, three BBLs, sugar, 25 BBLs, flour, four BBL, bread, molasses, boxes, dry goods, sun dries. Y'all get it, they were anchored down. They brought with them $9,000 in gold, nine men for the journey, first and second mates, and, and his self made 12 on board. So they're on the schooner, Clotilda, 12 people on board, $9,000 in gold, and they got hella food, uh, alcohol, and water available to them. March, this is the journal, March 7, crossed Mobile Bar with fair winds and made island of Cuba in three and a half days from the from Bermuda, had rough water, main boom of other damages, March 17, 10 days later, Bermuda, uh, off Bermuda, 60 miles north, encountered a heavy gale of wind less than nine days with great damage to the vessel, having shipped at sea which carried overboard everything on deck except two boats, one fastened on top of midship's house and one on the cabin's house. Also carried away boats, davits, half the st uh, steering wheel, and split the rudder, head in three pieces. Portuguese, man of war, chasing us from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. This dude in, in 1860 encounters the Portuguese, and they're chasing them from 8 in the morning to 6 p.m. Squalls all day and about dark, our uh, foresail went out of the boat rope in splinters, the most exciting race I ever saw. So let me stop real quick, and I want to bring this up. When was the illegal slave trade? Hmm? Y'all should know this. 1800s, 1808, it took effect. So indeed, this is during the illegal slave trade era. A U.S. boat leaving for Africa to go purchase slaves. That's what he said his goal was. He goes on in the April. He talked about how, look, 
April 14th, sighted the island Togo, Cape de Verde, 16 two day. Later came to anchor at Porto Prayer, Cape de Verde. While running to land at Togo at 8 a.m., we sighted a Portuguese man of war running for us. We changed course to get away from her, not wishing to be boarded so early on voyage as he would follow us for capture. Now, having arrived at Porto Praia, Cape Verde, came the trouble to save the vessel. My crew refused duty and I thought my voyage broken up. However, I made a bargain with my crew to double their wages from the first agreement in Mobile. And they went to work cheerfully to repair the vessel and did not have any trouble with the American consul, notwithstanding his tactic guessing as to my witherbound, but gave me clearance to trade on the coast of Africa and recommended to me to go to the island of Annabal and sell my cargo. And there was a famine on the island. So remember, he's got goods. Right? He looks like he's just there doing business. Now, they set sail to trade on the coast while getting uh, uh, underway to leave Port Prayer, not knowing the current. Right? So they approach again, a man of war and carried out uh, way bumpkins, set sail, and they're doing their thing. He tells us everything that he does. He arrives to take, because I know you might catch the replay. He arrived in Weida on the 15th of May, anchored one and a half miles from the shore at 4 p.m. A boat boarded us the same evening to know our business. I told him we wished to exchange commodities and therefore would have to see the prince and officials. The sea rolling at fearful height at the time, we could not land in our boats. But the natives had boats 60 feet long, man by 20 natives, darted through the waves like fish. Having gotten ashore safely, I met the interpreters who kindly congratulated me and gave me uh, uh and gave me hold on, let me see this. In charge of three natives. So he gave him he, he gave him permission to run the three natives, who put me in a hammock and uh canopy and carried me until the city of Weeda, six mile distance. Upon arrival, I found splendid accommodations for traders. I spent the night in merchants exchange. Having breakfast early, I with uh, Cicerone, right? It's the name that, that appears up there. It's the person he with. Now, he says, Cicerone presented me uh, the Ebony Prince, a man of 250 pounds. <clears throat> he continued to tell the story about all of that. So 12 days out of Weeda site, Camp Palmas and the Man of Water. I'm skipping some of this because I don't want to read all of it. But he's in Africa. We know that. He's doing his thing. He politicking. July the 9th, they went ashore, gave residents $25 for a horse and buggy to make it to Mobile. That's when he returns. So from his last business venture in May 15th, and he writes about purchase and everything else he got going on. When he gets back in July, he tells you what happened. He said he came back to Mobile and took on board the tug of five men and eight thousand dollars landed at the vessel at nine p.m. These are his letters. These are his words, and they are documented. Captain William Foster. So, what up, what up, Arafat? What up, Zane? Now, where are the slave ships? This technology that I have shown you today will answer every question about where the slave ships are. But who you think has control over <clears throat> the ability to really get out there and uncover all the wreckage and locate all the ships. Now you're saying, what makes this significant? Well, first of all, <clears throat> the Southern Miss team that found Clotilda also know that there's a story about why they found Clotilda 
they found Clotilda. Foster knew that he went to Africa, traded for them uh, slaves during the illegal slave trade era. It was illegal to trade for slaves. He brought them back in a schooner, which was faster than the maritime ships against the water. Brought them back. And what you think he did with the schooner? What y'all think he did with the schooner? Hmm? He went to destroy the schooner. After he stated his business, did what he had to do, came back with what he came back with, all of that stuff, he took the schooner to a non-disclosed location away from where he came in at, in a riverbed, right? Somewhere where no one else was and burned the schooner, trying to get rid of the evidence. He got his slaves. He got his slaves. Now, the funny part about all of this is that this story, ladies and gentlemen, right? Genealogy helped the dude that ain't that that's related to the dude who went and got the shit reveal all of that to him. And he went to go apologize to the people. Now, mind you, these people are worth like $40 million today or more or more. But these black people who are descendants of the last slave was like, well, I don't even, I don't even really want anything from the people. Bullshit. What do you mean you don't want nothing? They kidnapped your grandfather, your ancestor, drug his ass and, and other people here to the Americas, worked them refusely against his will, built their wealth off that, off primarily off the backs of blacks, and you don't want them? They owe all y'all. But they're not trying to recognize that that's what happened and that's where their wealth comes from. So therefore, that's why they ain't even addressing the black people now. I want to show you what I'm talking about. I'm not going to play the video because it will definitely, it will definitely ding us, right? It will definitely ding us. But in a 60 minute video that went up four days ago, right? He talked to the people. He talked to people. He, meaning Anderson Cooper, everybody know who this motherfucker is, right? He talked to him. Look, he talked to the people about how to make the ship, the, all the stuff that, that was found out there, all of that. How they used the hydrography to help map it out, they, they, all of that, right? They gave him a clear understanding. The dive was the whole nine, all of that. But look, this is the man right here. He even, I got him in the in the uh the thumbnail. This is the church that they grant they uh granddaddy went to. They still go to that same church. All that stuff. This lady is like a historian. But it was this lady right here. Hold on. I know I won't get dinged if I just play a little bit. So I I I gotta uh I gotta play this part. Court file. Hold up. Let me um y'all should be able to hear that, right? Could y'all hear that? Yeah, y'all can hear that. All right, so let me do this. Flings indicate their real estate and timber businesses are worth an estimated $36 million. 
But so far, the descendants we spoke with say no one from the mayor family has been willing to meet. I don't think it's something that people want to remember. Because they have to acknowledge that they benefit from it today. That yeah. they benefited. That's yeah. it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That they benefited. And, and they don't want to take People don't want to look back mm-hmm. and they acknowledge, don't want to acknowledge it. it. Acknowledge That's it. how mm-hmm. part of that wealth was derived. And Big that part. on the backs of those people. What would you want to say to them? I mean, if, if they were willing to sit down and have, you know, have a it's coffee with them. We would first need to acknowledge what was done in the past. Yeah. And then there's an accountability piece yes. that your family for, for this many years, five years, owned my ancestors. And then the third piece would be how do we partner together with an Africa town? I don't want to receive anything personal. Right. Mm-hmm. When she said that right there, man, I just kind of pushed myself from the table. You're talking about a family whose businesses are into the 36, she said, they said 36 on it, but $40 million? They owe every last one of them in them. But the problem is, is that it's going to break them. So they're trying to avoid all get out. And it's set up for them to avoid all get out. They know who the people were. They know who they were owned by. They know when they took the boat to go get them. This is the best because it's the last ship, y'all. This is the best, the best step-by-step scientific process. None of these motherfuckers is claiming to be Indians, indigenous to the Americas. Because this was last. This is when writing was really at a peak and even black people was sneaking and writing and reading. This, this... Couldn't have been no better placed. And the old man lived for quite some time. So he was able to pass on a lot of the information. But not to see, you still can play it, bro, because I'm not playing it. I'm not playing it. Just, just that part. You feel me? Um, This the dude. This the dude right here. You know, this the dude. I think it's his cousin or uncle or whatever the case may be. And you know what I'm saying? Just like good old Christian black folk, you know, just like good old Christian black folk, we want to forgive everybody. We want to forgive everybody. I think that was disheartening. So to uh, Get us back to how we're able to uncover where these ships are, right? Remember, the research question is, where are the ships? In order for us to fully answer their question to where we don't even have to acknowledge them again, although we know the ships exist, we know that we need a hydrography and a hydrographic team to help assist us and what well, to help assist the aboriginals in fully understanding that this this, this shit happened we need we need a multi beam echo sounder beams so that they can pan the floors we need to be fully transparent in this scientific endeavor so that everything can be there we're going to need the xrf testings done we're going to need the magnometers out there we will need a team led by not only uh, white people, but we're going to need some black people out there, right? We got to need people to fully understand what they what these scientists are looking at, right? And I just gave you a general breakdown of that. But these were the pieces that led to the discovery of this. Not only this, but there's others. So when y'all ask us where the ships are, the technology and tools do exist to help us answer the research question fully. But are you prepared to take your DNA test while they scan the floor? Because we know who we are, where we come from. And it ain't just one ship. It's plenty. Like I said, I went over to Not A Seas channel and I showed a whole list of of ships. I don't have to keep doing none of that stuff. We were not here. 
you're brown skin, light skin, dark skin. You got those African features. You us. If you have those uh, those four genetic genes of the Novices and Neanderthals, you're not us. If your African ancestors admixed with the natives that were here, I don't even like really saying the word in at this point, but the natives that were here, the paleo that were here, the paleo natives that were here, Don't negate your African ancestry because of the history behind it. You survived it. Your ancestors survived a Holocaust. So I wanted to keep that brief and digestible. Brief and digestible now we can argue just make sure you have your evidence so if you want to refute anything right here i can go further i can go further but if you want to refute anything that was presented today good luck because i just provided you the scientific tools to help complete the historical moment for people in Africa time that was significant for their history. What are we doing? I'm here. What are we doing? So to the 12 year old kid who was confused about their existence, I hope this helps you Take a step back and really go look and do your due diligence to substantiate what you've been told on TikTok, Instagram, Snapchat. Who won't smoke? Come on, man, I'm here. I'm here for it. Whatever y'all want. Y'all, you, do you, you really want me to get in the ship manifest? Remember, we pulled this up before where we had all the evidence of different ships and their manifest. I gave y'all that information before in a previous bill. I just want to know how far we need to go. How far? Damn, you honor. I've been up early, man. Worked up. And to the idiot that brought up the uh, the Amistad stuff, man, that was crazy, ridiculous. I don't know how we got to that. I still, I, I can't, I can't even remember that. That's how we got to that. That was crazy. Yeah, social media does suck. The African body was the first commodity sold worldwide on the global market. Facts. We need our check exactly there's no way there's no that's what i'm saying like bro we were on the stock exchange we were on the stock exchange everybody owe us we were on the fucking stock exchange you could trade you could day trade for the amount of fucking man come on man look at how people trade bro i think that might have been a root word with the whole amistad shit that was like the dumb, that was like totally dumb. Him or uh, smoke signal, one of them dummies. One of them dummies. I don't think that happened. Them dudes, idiots. Let me see if I can um 
see if I can go pull something else up real quick. Nah, I didn't my game or shit. Let me try to heat up this uh this tool. Now the information that I, I gave y'all earlier, let me show y'all something real quick. It's a resourceful tool. This is from the same source that I used earlier, but if you just what I all you did, if you just go back to the main screen, click on videos, uh, it'll give you some basis of certain stuff. Right. And um this stuff is significant and answering a lot of questions. But I wanted to uh I wanted to bring this out because hold on, I'm gonna play this video real quick, but I wanted to bring this out because ask yourself how many people actually study the technology that is used to help uncover or answer a lot of these questions. That music trash, bro. I ain't no cap. Scientific research doesn't always take place in a laboratory, so neither should your science class. At Florida A&M University's Environmental Sciences Institute, students now have the opportunity to join a program that gives them access to the biggest science lab in the world, the ocean. Students at Sea is a three-day research cruise that takes place off the Florida Panhandle in the Gulf of Mexico. The purpose of these cruises is to give the students at Florida A&M University a hands-on field research experience. We carry out an ecosystem inventory and we collect samples from the water using a Niskin, a Niskin rosette and a CTD. We also collect samples, plankton samples from the water column, uh, both phytoplankton and zooplankton. And finally, um, the last operation that we do is we do a sediment grab sample because we want to see what the water column productivity looks like and how it affects the sediments. The Students at Sea program aims to broaden the horizon for students who may not have traditionally considered a career in environmental science. Since over 90% of the ocean is unexplored, the program is literally opening up a whole new world of discovery and opportunity. This trip in particular has helped me to realize a couple of things that um, I had noticed in the past. It brings me closer to the ocean and allows me to see up close what I study in the classroom in textbooks. As a young child, I used to watch Discovery Channel and see Jacques Cousteau and people like that and wonder if I could ever be like that. Through the courses that I've taken, I've been able to see um, the medicinal aspect of the, the marine environment that most people aren't aware of, the type of advantages that it gives um, the society. And uh, most people aren't aware of the type of things we can get from it, the things we can learn from marine organisms. So it gives you a lot more insight on um, what you can do with this type of research and uh, its applications. Good, yeah, man. Get interested in, in the ocean, bro. Yeah, I'll be trying to uh, down run away from like tools, man. These things help us be able to answer shit, bro. For real. For real. One more. One more. I hope now. All right, let's teach them. One more. And after this, you know what I'm saying? Henry Stommel, an eminent oceanographer from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, envisioned the day that there would be a thousand swimming robots in the sea. His vision has been partially realized with the technology in autonomous underwater vehicles, AUVs, computer-controlled systems operating under the water. You know, when you kind of compare vehicles, some of them look like torpedoes, some of them look like stingrays, some of them look like things with flippers on them. I mean, so the breadth of that, I think, is pretty exciting. Um, and what they can do. They're designed with the intelligence to perform their tasks, identify problems, and adapt to different situations. AUVs can help protect our environment, as well as mitigate threats to our national security. And now, they are even being used to search for sunken history. 
So when you take AUV technology, you can see how the ships maneuvered, where the cannonballs landed, where all the um, ship debris scattered as they, as they blew up. And that gives you greater insight into the decisions that were made on those significant days. Autonomous underwater vehicles can be equipped with sophisticated sensing devices. These sensors can measure different ocean characteristics. Others can provide images of objects under the water or even buried below the ocean bottom. Since visibility under the sea is usually poor, sound or sonar is used to create these acoustic pictures. Side-scan sonar can produce very realistic imagery of objects and the seafloor. As the ping or sound wave travels underwater, it will reflect off objects such as sunken ships. The sonar distinguishes between these objects and creates darker light regions that make up the astonishingly clear images we are able to see today. Since the 1990s, the Office of Naval Research has been investing in AUVs and their advanced sensors to help search for mines. Now, marine archaeologists are able to use this amazing technology and put it to use exploring sunken history. Over 2,000 shipwrecks can be found in the waters off Rhode Island which has more shipwrecks than any other state per square mile. Oh, said it again. Said it again. Oh, look. Nah, 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 nah. Don't run out of the way back, bro. Don't run out of the way back, bro. Oh, this, this is... Oh, the cap in this rap. Hold on, y'all. I should have downloaded it. That was instrumental, man. I didn't know it was going to take me back. I was going to let it play for a second. I should have downloaded the video. But he said Rhode Island had over 2,000. Here you go. The transcript right here. I don't even need him to speak no more. Over 2,000 shipwrecks can be found in the waters of Rhode Island, which has more shipwrecks than any other state per square mile. These shipwrecks include uh, British frigates international burned and sunk during the Revolutionary War in 1778 to avoid capture by the French. Four of these shipwreck sites, including the HMS Breeze and Landmarks and yada, 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 several discoveries being made in advance of remote. Come on. Now, now, now you're taking me, now you're taking me somewhere else. Now you're taking me somewhere else. And y'all are watching this shit live, so you know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know about how everybody else does their research. And I don't know how everybody else attacks a research question. So it the only way for me to be able to show y'all how I operate in real time, I mean, how I operate is to do it in real time. So when I hear something, I have to go somewhere else. Period, point blank. Right? So he said, right, that there's over 2,000 shipwrecks off the coast of Rhode Island. So I went to go look up how many shipwrecks are off the coast of South Carolina. And these are shipwrecks that are off the coastline of Carolina, whether, document, whether documented accurately or not. So you have Brown's Vessel, right? Uh, Brown's Ferry Ferries, Canoes, um, the Clydesdale Plantation Wreck. What's this about? Uh, Clydesdale Vessel was discovered in the fall of 91 during a survey on the Back River Secondary Channel of Savannah River by a private underwater archaeology team, a uh, nocturnal archaeologist from A&M. Uh, they excavated the shipwreck under the uh, auspices of the S uh, South Carolina IAA and the Army Corps of Engineers of Savannah. Archaeology determined the shipwreck was a rare example of 18th century coastal sloops that once linked Savannah, Charleston, Georgetown, and other majors during the colonial period. 
So I guarantee you if we go in and we start digging a little bit more, we may get more history on the Clydesdale plantation brick. And if it was used uh, to move people. Hillhead Island, right? Go on there and do more. For me, everything is about substantiating information. Ingram Vessel. The last one was uh, significant as well. Like these, the 19th century, 18th and 19th century. Like these, these little things right here are critical. H. L. Hunley, 1863. So I just wanted to go to uh, South Carolina real quick, just to see. We probably can do this all along the East Coast. There's more than 1,800 vessels off the coastal line of uh, Virginia. Looking out of Chesapeake Bay on a fair day alive uh, with many boats and ships, you might not suspect that the remains of many once seaworthy vessels litter the bay's bottom. More than 1,800 vessels have met their end in bay waters. Shipwrecks lying broken and battered on the bay's floor allow us to look back at the way people once lived, worked, and traveled in Chesapeake. Mm hmm. So they got 1,800. Rhode Island got 2,000. And y'all know what we're going to uncover. Y'all know what we're going to uncover when we start looking, we get the list of all the names and we start breaking down them names. We're going to find more and more. Hold on one second, y'all. Let me send, uh, I need to send this pedigree to my cousin. We just had one dog bleeding, one just started bleeding a day. We got to get her tested and see where she at so we can make sure uh, what we need. We strategic breeders. But y'all know what's going to happen, right? Y'all know what we're going to do, right? Put that information in y'all face. So, um, hold on. What day is this? May 1206. 1206. May what? When I post this, May 23rd. Y'all know what we're going to cover. Then we're going to be right back here busting y'all ass about some information. Boom. Yep. Got to also explain why. Ah, oh, shit. Them little lotuses in the chat. <laughs> yeah man so and just to just to uh just to deal with i mean what Khalil is saying in the chat Rhode Island played a central role in the American slave trade during the 1700s. And a total of about 1,000 slave trading voyages. Uh, let me pull it up and put it on the screen for those of you who think that this is made up by Khalil. 
and the support that it's not only just Rhode Island, but we can walk it the way we need to. So here's a primary source of a slave narrative, slave revolt on a slave ship. Okay, this is significant here because this, right, narrative of slave revolt on a ship off Africa, and it tells you what's going on and where it's headed. All right, now back to back to this. Most Americans think of slavery as a southern institution. In fact, the American slave trade was centered in New England. That's what we need to see how many ships off of. New England colonies from uh, and enslaved labor throughout the New England colonies in the mid-1600s. Uh, then you had the American Revolution with slavery legally existing in Rhode Island until 1842. Near the peak of the northern slavery in 1750s in towns and some parts of southern uh, Rhode Island. But the population was pretty much 30% black and enslaved. A few enslaved people still labored in New England. And on the eve of the Civil War, long after militant northern abolitionists had declared war on the southern slavery. So just to just to bag him up, because this comment is on the screen, is there. There you go. The Atlantic slave trade, the first slave voyaging to bring captive Africans to Rhode Island took place in 1696 when a Boston ship, the Sea Flower, look at that. Where are the ships? Sea Flower brought 47 captives from the coast of Africa, sold 14 of them to Newport. The first recorded slaving voyage to depart from Rhode Island took place in 1700 when three sailing vessels from Newport went to Africa and brought captives from there to Barbados. So the sea flower. Mayflower to sea flower. Y'all remember that? Do I really got to pull it up? Mm -hmm. Look like y'all asked for it. So here you go. They got the voyage identification number. They got all the information right there. The flag was Great Britain, British American. It was constructed in 1734. It was owned by LaRoche James, Hobhouse, and Isaac Hobhouse. So James LaRoche and Isaac Hobhouse. You can do all kind of stuff, yo. That, that was slave voyages, by the way. But I can do this live all day, and I don't want to do this live all day because every time I I get one question answered, then I, I have other questions answered, and then it takes me on a journey back uh, to deal with other things. Now, I will drop that uh, that last link in the chat, and I'll see, and I'm going to put it in the description of the video, some of the other sources that was used here. Uh, because I don't think that it's going to come in the chat correctly for you to be able to try to grab that if you wanted to use that uh, information um, and anyone else. So let me go on here live and do that shit right now. But I see we ain't got no questions, comments, concerns. It ain't damn sure ain't nobody that's back there that can push back. Mm. On the information that's presented today, they'll probably uh you're gonna tell me to get a book I probably already got. Go ahead. Which book? What book, Arafat. Let me see if we on the same thing. I don't think that they're going to play this video back. If they play this video back, they're in trouble. 
Man, look, y'all ain't even liking the video, man. How y'all in the chat and ain't liking the video, bro? Like, what's up with y'all? It's 24 likes. African Americans in Boston. Okay, I ain't got that. By Robert Hayden. They had me arguing with some motherfuckers in Boston. Um, bro, okay, I put the Rhode Island in there, South Carolina joint, I put that in there. Uh, yeah, that's all you need. Boom. There you go. African Americans in Boston by Robert. Let me look it up right now. By Robert. Are the books only 196 pages? Oh, this is easy work. That's a few days. Yeah, I got it, bro. Real quick lock. Is African Americans in Boston more than 350 years by Robert C. Hayden, right? The Internet Archives has the book as well. You said, look what? All right, and check this K Verde soldier, Jokum Piss. What page? What page is it on? What page? I'm buying a book, bro. But uh, what page you on? If you don't know, that's cool. Okay, the first Africans came to Boston in 16830. Oh, let me share my screen. Damn, that would help. Now, I ordered a book, I did it on Amazon, but um, so here it is, Black Africans in Boston before, there is no reason to believe that Black Africans were in Boston area earlier than 1638. John Jocelyn, an entire writer of the New England history, visited Noodles Island in Boston Harbor in 1637 and reported that he found in the possession of Samuel Maverick, three Negroes, two women and one man. New England slave trade, 1644, significant. Black Africans from the West Indies. Bostonian Ken of Dorchester was perhaps the first black landowner in Massachusetts. Of course, we all know the Prince Hall shit. Yep. They go to me house. Everybody should know that this is a fucking meat house. That's where the free blacks in Boston live, the Cato, Garner. Not in the book. He sank the Confederate crews. Oh, okay. Female Intelligence Society. There's some history in this motherfucker. This is a lead on this a lead on a wild goose chase right here, bro. This right here. 
You'd be researching the research. Pope, you probably like, you ain't gonna get the book and, and, and don't think I got it. And don't think I ain't gonna get the book. I'm gonna get the book too. He just ain't saying that shit in the chat. The motherfucker online ordering it right now too. None of them people that you're seeing on the screen, bro, don't think that they ain't, they weren't indigenous to, to this place. They all knew they were African. The fight for school equality, Premise Hall, first black public school, a Delphi Union library, Cyrus Foster, a griot of Boston. Y'all already know where that word griot come from, right? Jolet in Africa, in West Africa. Certain places in West Africa, Jolet. This mug rich. This mug rich, just like everywhere else, man. It's it's rich. Like I don't even know where we running from, bro. This is a dope. Uh, this is dope right here. Black Heritage Trail, show you the meeting house, the Smith Court residence, the Abigail School, all of this shit. It show you all of the significant places right there. That's that's dope. Man, make me want to go to Boston to see the shit. I don't know nobody in Boston, though. Yeah, so I ain't putting this in the description. But the book is available to you to, you know what I mean? Look at it online. And it's not a big book. Like I said, it's only 187 pages. So most of this is just uh, jewels. So, you know, with books like this, like, for instance, first federal position, William C. Nell was appointed a postal clerk in the U.S. postal system in 1860, becoming the first African-American to hold a federally civil, uh, civilian job in the city. Like you will go looking. Well, not you, but me. I will go look more into him in that or i would go on i would go look up lewis hayden where it says right here look lewis hayden i'm trying to make it as big as i can right let's see if i can get further there you go you should be able to see this real good so lewis hayden a leading 19th century black abolitionist who harbored over two-thirds of boston's fugitive slaves in beacon hill uh, Beacon Hill House prior to the Civil War was elected to the Massachusetts General Court. See, I go look, I try to go look into the history of uh, Hayden to uh, figure out more of, you know, his existence, his role, and his, con his contribution to African American history, especially dealing with the uh, Underground Railroad. But um, listen, man, I'm not going to keep everybody here. Like I said, I get to digging and then I'll continue to keep digging. And then it's just one of those things where I'm just digging. And I might become a little bit bored. But um, I did update the description with those last two sources. Um, I do want to keep this bite size with an hour 43 and counting. I want to appreciate everybody for tuning in. Please like the show, share the show, tell a friend, tell a friend that uh, we're dispelling all myths. We attack all misinformation. We don't care what side of the information, the misinformation is on. It could be our friends, family members, parents, grandparents, ancestors. We're correcting that shit. If we can correct Dr. Ben, if we can correct some of the misinformation from a lot of misinformation from J.A. Rogers and Van Sertimas of the world and 
a lot of people in the community today and all of that stuff. Other people can get corrected. They don't like being corrected. Well, thanks, shows are just about them. Your ass get corrected, too. So, uh, again, like the show, share the show. Appreciate everybody tapping in. Um, we learned a lot today. Hopefully, you learned a lot. You know what I mean? I just thought that it was, it was quite interesting to bring that information out just to be with the tech, technological side and action or research question. Right. So the tools are there, are available to have the research question answered accurately. The problem is. It's us having the capability of being able to. To do that, so we need more people in that field that will make that a priority, but also funds would need to be available to fund. Uh, that type of stuff so that uh, our people could do that and. Uh, One more thing, man. If you don't have any command of the subject matter and you want to run your mouth on a platform, you need to think twice. And you also need to do me a favor. Shut the fuck up. And just stay out of it until you're learned in the subject matter. Therefore, allowing the opportunity for growth and development and the advancement of the subject matter to transpire.